Well, good morning, everyone. I'm not visible. <laughs> that's not, hang on. That's not on purpose. That's just my webcam stopped for some reason. Hang on. Let me figure out what's going on with my webcam. Oh, okay. There I am. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, but yeah, sometimes like if I deselect and then reselect the webcam, it'll wake up. I don't know what happened. Anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a live stream for electronic literature. This is uh, a live stream for section one of electronic literature, uh, a class at the University of Mary Washington. Uh, and so if you're watching this, you're probably one of my students. And so good morning. I hope, I'm glad to see you all. Um, I hope you all uh, continue to enjoy the Twitch streaming format. I was kind of thinking about it because, you know, we've obviously been Zooming a lot too, and then I'm thinking ahead to next year, right? I mean, not for this class per se, but for all my classes in the fall. Uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be mostly in person for those, I guess, but I think there might be some, you know, some sometimes where it makes more sense to, to be online, or maybe there's an opportunity to continue that. Um, I was thinking about it, like, I, I definitely think there are some advantages to being able to stream because I can demo things. But like, I don't really have anything particularly, you know, to demo, uh, like anything so very software intensive to demo today. But I think I just kind of, um, I think I, I kind of enjoyed like the theatricality of a live stream, you know, it's just sort of kind of me putting on a show and I kind of like that. I don't know. It's not something that I ever would have thought I would enjoy, but I do seem to kind of enjoy that. So I hope you all, you know, don't mind it at least and maybe even uh, find something valuable about this. Uh, all right, so I'm just switching down my screen, actually. Sorry, I'm moving Chrome around a little bit just to uh, adjust a couple things here to make sure I can put all of this in view as as you as you see here. Um, yeah, I've got the bird cam going still. I don't have anything, actually. I've not seen any birds the past couple of days. Um, I don't know if they're just, you know, finding other feeders because there are tons of other feeders. I refilled my other one uh, finally, so maybe they're just happy with that. But, you know, it would be nice to see some... Uh, somebody here. I haven't seen the ants again. I saw some ants the other day and I haven't, but I don't see them now, so maybe they gave up. I don't know. Or maybe they ate whatever was all there, whatever was there to eat. Uh, I don't know. So today we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about the third generation of electronic literature, a term coined by and um, defined by and, a, and really a conversation initiated by Leo Flores. So this is, um, yeah, good point, Kira. Maybe that's, uh, that is good. It, I mean, this, the, I think the video quality is a lot higher over Twitch, for one thing, and that's where sometimes it does um, help. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're going to talk about the... Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the third generation of electronic literature. So uh, let me... Here's my slideshow. Uh, so um, this is a term uh, really coined by Leo Flores. Leonardo Flores is the... Uh, I don't remember what his exact title is, but is it director or president? Um, I don't know. Um, uh, premier, uh, I don't know, whatever, like he's the, whatever it is, I think it's president of the uh, Electronic Literature Organization currently. I should check, I should look that up. But uh, Leo is um, a great am ambassador for the, the genre and for the academic community and, and a real, you know, thought leader in the area. So um, when he presented this idea of the third generation of electronic literature a couple years ago, it was really influential. A lot of people really latched onto this and found it to be a really helpful way to think about what's going on right now with electronic literature and kind of where we are. And it really helps to, um, to periodize uh, the things we've been doing. And I think there's also a way to use this idea of the third generation of electronic literature to really critique some of the inherent structures of uh, the electronic literature community and I think um, I don't have a lot to say about that right now but this is something I've been thinking about and that I've, I've noticed in light of some recent developments within that community uh, so I'm, I'm interested to continue exploring um, and thinking about the third generation of ELIT not just as uh, a description of what's going on recently like not just recent work in electronic literature but as a, a way into uh, critiquing and un unpacking some of the um, power structures, I guess, within the electronic literature community. So yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll probably say some more about that later on. Uh, but uh, for today, I want to talk about what the third gen is and uh, give you a couple of updates related to a project that I have in mind for you related to the third gen. So uh, I'm going to describe that and a few other things in here. Let me let's see, I'll go full screen. Well, no, I'll go um, not full screen, but 
semi full screen um, with this so I can have all my tabs up still. Um, yeah, and I'll get back to Canvas in a minute, but um, let's see. I just have to take out that delay just in case I accidentally hit play on it so it won't start playing. So here we are. So a few reminders and updates. So this is week 10, so I'll be seeing the even cohorts again on Wednesday. Um, so meet in HCC 329. Um, if you are in an odd cohort or even the online only cohort and you desperately want to attend in person, um, probably I can fit a couple more people in the classroom. So um, really just one or two. So uh, let me know and I might be able to squeeze you in. Um, but definitely check with me first because uh, one of the cohorts is, is maxed out. So if all of them attend, then then I can't let anyone else in. So um, please check with me if you'd like to attend in person, but otherwise I'll just see the even cohorts in person. Everyone else, you'll be on Zoom. It's the same Zoom link now from now on, so just check on Canvas and you should see the, if you go into the Zoom settings, uh, the Zoom tab in Canvas, you should see the link to the uh, the Zoom for section one. So check on that and click that link on Wednesday at 10.10. 10. Um, so also by Wednesday, the thing I'd like to talk about is I'd like to return to an interactive fiction. Um, today is a bit of a detour, but you'll see there are connections to interactive fiction. And one of these is, as you'll see, um, Black Mirror, which is a, um, a TV show, it's on Netflix. And they did an episode called Bandersnatch, which is interactive. And so I would like for you to watch and uh, experience that, I guess, I don't know what the right verb is, play, um, interact with, uh, Bandersnatch on, on Black, uh, Bandersnatch, <laughs> Bandersnatch on Netflix. It's a, so you need Netflix, obviously, to get to that. Um, I, I, I have done, like, whenever I, I require or assign something on Netflix, I find that almost everybody has Netflix already, so that hasn't been a, a challenge to, to help people find, but if that is the case that you don't have access to Netflix, uh, please let me know and I can help you get access to Netflix. If you don't currently subscribe to Netflix, you can do a seven, I think it's a seven day free trial. Um, and if you've already used a free trial, there is a way to um, get another one, even with the same email address, um, a, using a trick that I call the uh, infinite Gmail trick. And I can show you that trick if you're interested. Um, I'll do it, I won't do it on the live stream, but um, it is possible. The only um, caveat with the infinite gmail trick is that it's a free trial you still have to use a credit card to sign up for the free trial and if you forget to cancel it then you will get charged for it so you know that's could be an issue but um just don't forget to unsubscribe don't forget to unsubscribe if that's your and if you're uh, only accessing netflix with the trial uh, okay so if you have any questions about it please ask but otherwise uh, i mean bandersnatch it's um I don't want to say self-explanatory because it is kind of mysterious, but after you have watched and experienced uh, Bandersnatch, there's something else I would like for you to look at as well. It goes along with it, uh, which is, um, so you can, you know, you can access it here. I guess I've got a link to it in the schedule. Uh, but the thing I would like for you to do after you've read, watched, played, whatever the term is for Bandersnatch, um, take a look at these thoughts about it by uh, Emily Short. So Emily Short, the author of Galatea, is also a really prolific critic of interactive fiction. And I don't mean critic as in criticizing it, but uh, critic as in a literary critic. Like she does a lot of great work to review and uh, critique and talk about how interactive fiction works and new, she does a lot of reviews of new works and so on. So she's very, you know, um, good at these things. And this is a review or a response to Bandersnatch and she kind of summarizes some other people's responses. So I think it's really good to kind of put, it, to put together some of the uh, different points of view about it. So please read this as well. Um, after you've watched it. Um, it. It also kind of contains some spoilers and of course because it's interactive whether or not you encounter certain things might depend on your choices but it still is better to try to do it yourself first and then come here and read this. Uh, and this is just a, like a short blog post so um, mainly your homework is Bandersnatch but also that. And then it's the standard homework options uh, as we usually do. Okay so let me know if you have questions about that but otherwise I think that part's pretty straightforward. Uh, I do want to talk about the third generation project or the 3G project. Um, this is the idea. Uh, the assignment description here is available in, in Canvas. Uh, I want to talk through this a little bit. Um, I'm not going to stand here and read the whole thing, but I do want to talk through the basic idea, which is that, uh, as we'll see in the, the notes in the lecture here, uh, the, third gen, uh, the third generation of electronic literature is really defined by um, stuff you already have access to. So it's things that are already out there, like the, the tools, the, uh, the distribution platforms, these are things that you're already experiencing, things like social media. And they're being, when they're being used in a literary way, then that's when we would call that an example of a third gen work. So the 
idea is for this assignment to it, it, the idea is to use a third generation tool and I've got some examples here to critique well there's different verbs here um, you can uh, as an homage a response to a critique of or a sequel to a first or second generation work of your choice so if you remember from the essay and from or from the video I don't know if, if you watched the video or read the essay but um, one of uh, Leo's ideas about the third gen is that it's a um, a work or it's a it's characterized by postmodern aesthetics and one of the um, characteristics of postmodern aesthetics is or I guess tropes of postmodern aesthetics is uh, appropriation or remix and I would like that's the kind of thing I'm kind of thinking of I guess using a third generation tool to appropriate remix respond to whatever the verb is some first or second generation work so there's a bit of a historical uh, research on, on your part to find a work of a first or second generation that you feel like you want to respond to or critique or make a sequel to or whatever um, and then uh, uh, but use it do it in a third generation way so here's some examples I think this might help but uh, we'll talk about these and you've seen ser several examples in the context of um, the uh, you know the, the essay but here's a couple of like just ways that I think uh, you might think about uh, finding something to do here. So these are examples of third gen genre, genres or platforms. Um, Instagram poetry, social media bot, uh, like Twitter bots, Twine games, kinetic typography, Netprov, Remix, uh, touchscreen uh, apps, AR, VR, video games, memes. Um, these are these are characteristic genres of the third generation. These are not all of the genres and these are not the only things you could do, but these are just meant to be examples and yeah, I'm sure you can think of others. Um, I think TikTok, right? I mean, TikTok is a, an example of a third generation platform if you use TikTok to do something literary. So if you want to make a TikTok video about a first or second generation elit work, that would count. So um, I, I don't have TikTok, so you'd have to kind of tell me how to do that, I guess, or show me how to do that at some point. Uh, but I think, I guess you can link to it on the web if, if it's like, if you, if you publish a video on TikTok, I think you can make a public URL to it. I'm not totally sure but anyway um, I should add TikTok to the list here because it's it's a it's a unique kind of thing I guess um, you know since we don't have vine anymore uh, vine was great but it's, it's gone um, yeah so then like the thing that you do right so this is something to think about too like if you want to let's say make a TikTok about Zork <laughs> I'm just kind of throwing that out there um, what is the mode of your TikTok video like what is the purpose of your TikTok video is it to make fun of Zork or to tell people uh, uh, that they should appreciate Zork or to kind of make a joke about Zork or to make a sequel to Zork like what would Zork be if you if it was published today on TikTok that would be an interesting premise to start with and then maybe see what you come up with right I keep uh, mentioning TikTok just because that's an example that just occurred to me but you could also be like what would Zork be like if it was a Facebook group I don't know that would be kind of interesting too so these are things that you might want to think about so first or second gen um, these are basically anything published before 2005 we have looked at a lot of third generation works already so it just because we've already talked about it doesn't necessarily mean it's first or second gen but most of them are so um, if you have a particular work in mind that you're interested in and you're not sure what generation to align it with um, which of course just check, check with me I guess um, ultimately it doesn't really matter but uh, I'm interested in older works if possible and as I was thinking about things today in my putting my lecture together I think that actually um, at least formally in, like in terms of the form that these things take um, there's a lot of things that I think that third gen and first gen have perhaps more in common than either do with second gen. And um, that's sort of an idea that I'll just kind of throw out there for now and maybe elaborate on, on later as I think about it. But I'm thinking about kind of the purposes, like most people making what we now call first generation electronic literature didn't know they were making electronic literature. Um, they were just doing something because they thought it was neat. <laughs> um, and then I think that's the case now with third gen. A lot of people making third gen work aren't thinking about trying to make the next great electronic literary work. They're just doing something they think is neat. And so I think that's a, an interesting maybe co um, comparison to, to be interested in. Whereas a lot of people doing second gen are like very into electronic literature, very into hypertext interactive fiction, these very specific literary communities and trying to write or create works that address those communities. And so that's a very, I think a very different kind of, uh, at least a, a difference in terms of audience that unites first and second first and third but leaves second gen kind of on its own terms anyway um this is the assignment let me show you an example or two of uh, kind of what i'm thinking of and but like i don't want to 
give you too many examples because I, I want you to come up with your own ideas, but um, this is an example of, uh, if you hopefully remember when we talked about combinatory poetics, we talked about A House of Dust by Alison Knowles, and this is a Twitter bot by Hugo VK, who um, he actually used my uh, SS bot uh, platform to make this Twitter bot that generates stanzas of uh, A House of Dust by Alison Knowles. And so, you know, this is on Twitter, so you can see it's just, you know, it's a Twitter bot. So it just tweets these. Each stanza is tweeted as a single tweet, and, you know, it kind of goes from there. So uh, this is a very different way of consuming this work, of perceiving this work. Whereas if you watch my, um, my thing that prints it out, you, you kind of spend as, look, as much time with it as you feel like, and then you um, stop reading it. Uh, when Alison Knowles performs this work, she reads for however long she feels like until she decides she's done. Uh, and that's a, you know, that's a different way of experiencing the work. Uh, whereas this, you're seeing it kind of um, stanza by stanza by stanza, isolated from that context. And um, you know, you're, you're kind of dealing with each stanza on its own terms by itself as a kind of nugget of information that moves through uh, through Twitter. So it's a very different, it's, it's a remix, I think, of the work, even though it's literally doing the same thing. Um, looks like it stopped tweeting. I wonder if he did that on purpose or maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe it just stopped. Um, yeah, the other thing, by the way, about third generation work is like it exists in the context of Twitter and the Twitterverse. And so you see these tweets along, it's not just that we evaluate a house of brick in an overpopulated area using candles inhabited by all races of men represented wearing predominantly red clothing. It's not just that we look at it that way, but we see that alongside trending in the United States, satanic panic and Antifa and the container ship is now freed and moving. Um, so these are things that address our contemporary moment and discourse in, in, inside of Twitter. Um, and also I'm glad they got that dang ship moving. <laughs> That's good, good news, right? I don't know. Um, so these are, this is an example of a third gen work because it's a Twitter bot, but it's addressing and kind of telling people about a first gen work, which is The House of Dust by Alison Knowles. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions, obviously, please ask. You're, you're welcome to uh, ask them now in chat or um, either, either on Twitch or on Discord. But I'm going to move on with the slideshow and then kind of talk through some things. So if you have questions as I go through it or if a question occurs to you as I'm talking, then certainly feel free to ask. Okay, so we're talking about uh, electronic literature. So a couple of de uh, key definitions for today. Uh, one actually is electronic literature, even though we've really kind of defined that term to death at this point. Um, we, we initially thought of that as uh, digital born, like works that are digital born. That goes back to Catherine Hale's definition that we looked at like in the first day or two of the class, uh, works that need digital technology to exist. Um, and there's actually something a little bit different about Leo Flores' definition, and, and somebody commented on it in perusal. Uh, which I think is, is definitely worth underscoring. So a lot of times when we define electronic literature in the way that I just did from Catherine Hales, there's a bit of circularity to it because we say it's literature that happens to be born digital. Um, and that presumes that we know what we mean by literature. So that's something that might be debatable. And I kind of like what Leo does here by giving us a definition of literature too. So he, he adds this bit here, a writing centered art that engages the expressive potential of electronic and digital media. So the last part of that might as well be just a paraphrase of or a riff on Catherine Hales. But that first part, a writing centered art, I think that's actually a pretty significant intervention and it does shift the terms a little bit. Um, I, so I think that this is maybe a side point, but I think that, um, I think that definition is a bit, that part of the definition is a little bit debatable just because you know, what do we call literature, right? So um, I am certainly interested in, uh, for example, uh, graphic novels that don't have any dialogue or text in them. I think that's a pretty interesting literary genre. Like that's actually a whole genre. There's, a, there's several of them. So, um, so we might say that because they don't have words in them, they can't be considered writing-centered art. But I would say that like, you can consider it writing because it's composition, like there's an intentionality to the sequence and we can read the sequence. And so even if there aren't literally letters in there, we read the sequence of it and it's the fact that we read it that makes it literary to me. So I don't know if that would count as writing centered, but I definitely think it would count as literary. So, I mean, these are, these are maybe semantic debates. I don't think um, Leo puts a lot of stake in this. I mean, Leo's a pretty laid back guy. I don't think he really, uh, there's, there's a, I don't think there's a bright line where something stops being literary if, if you take the words away. 
Um, but I think it's an interesting way to, to kind of remind us what we're, what we're actually talking about. And also, this also lays the foundation for some of the things he does later in the essay where he talks about um, macro, image macro memes. That's the more technical name for the kinds of things that you all are doing in the memes channel in Discord. When you take an image and you put different text on it, um, that's a, a macro meme or an exploitable template is sometimes what it's called. And uh, Leo says that's definitely electronic literature according to his uh, definitions of it. So um, this is kind of how he lays the, the groundwork for that inclusion, which I think is, you know, makes sense. Okay, so here's a definition that he, I just pulled this out. He defines this a couple of ways, but this is probably the most succinct uh, expression of it in the essay that starting from around 2005 to the present, third generation uh, uses established platforms with massive user bases, such as social media networks, apps, mobile and touchscreen devices, and web API services. And I think the, the, mo the key point there is the established platforms. So there's something that we're already doing, something that, um, and I say we just kind of, you know, generally, of course, um, this includes, does not include everybody, right? But it includes people that are online and connected and, and have uh, access to these apps. Um, but these are apps you already have and that you use for some other purpose, like connecting to your friends or following influential people or whatever you do with your different um, apps and platforms. Uh, but now someone's doing something literary with it. In other words, there's no special thing you have to download and install in order to access these things. Um, you, you don't even have to go to a specific website to access these things. It's already kind of coming to you through your normal feeds of information and media that you that you consume. So that's that's a that's the big difference in third generation work. It has to do with uh, how you get to it, how you find new examples of it. Um, at the same time, there are also differences in terms of form, and that's where um, you talk about mobile and touch screen, touch screen devices, web API services. Those are things that are possible because of those distribution methods, but um, really the, the key is the distribution method. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so it's just another term to kind of help us think about it. So access, like things, these are things that you typically don't need to do something special to access. And here I don't mean access in the sense of accessibility, like um, in terms of making something like that, you might think of this term in the context of making your work accessible for um, users with disabilities or disabled people. Like these are, th that's not what the kind of access, I mean, I just mean literally like, you know, anyone accessing it. Although uh, uh, works in the third generation often are more accessible or they are kind of naturally accessible in the sense that they are, uh, or not naturally, I guess, but they are um, automatically as accessible as anything else in whatever platform. So if you're posting images on Twitter, for example, like um, I have an image based, I have several image based Twitter bots and um, I am haven't fully implemented this yet, but I've, I figured I have figured out now how to add alt text to the images that are being posted by my bots. So I can add alt description text for uh, people who can't see the images, so they'll still be able to understand what the image is. So that's that's accessibility in the context of uh, designing for dis uh, for access uh, in, in the context of disability. But uh, in the access that I mean here, this just means ever this just means that it's um, you don't have to do something special or weird in order to access it. It's just it's just there, I guess. Uh, okay, so another way to think of this maybe is everyday elit. I, I don't know if this is a, uh, the term here might con connote that it's just, uh, that there's a lesser quality or something quotidian or uh, boring or um, uh, amateur about it, but I, I, that's not what I mean by this. It just means that it's like it's something that you might just come across. And this is where uh, I think the discoveries channel is really, uh, cool in the uh, Discord for our class because you all are coming across stuff in your normal media com consumption and exploration and realizing, hey, this is electronic literature, and then you share it in there. And that's that's what I mean. Like, that's what we're talking about there. Something that you you come across, you might come across every day. Something that you wouldn't necessarily need to find in an anthology of electronic literature or in a textbook or something like that. It's something that you would just come across. Okay, so uh, here's a slide. Um, this is actually Leo's slide, but I just adapted it to Google Slides so it would be easier to read and uh, for me to kind of talk through. Um, and these are, these are built, so like these bullet points, and well, I can't point that far over without disappearing, but um, the, the second, the, the, they're parallel, so between the two. Um, and I didn't make this animated so they would reveal kind of point by point um, because I didn't have time, but uh, you can hopefully see how these go together. So whereas the second generation seeks originality and formal innovation, uh, the third generation builds upon existing forms. So it, it kind of takes something that already exists and then does something else with it. Whereas the second generation builds and adapts interfaces for works, the third generation adopts existing interfaces. So a lot of times for second generation works, like it's hyper, think of like uh, 12 blue, for example. Um, it's hypertext, but you still have to learn how to read it. Like it's, it's 
clicking links, but you still have to figure out like what links mean and where things are and like what kind of links there are. And so that learning process is a characteristic of a second generation work or even first gen. Um, but then a third generation, it's uh, something that's already intuitive. Like you already know how to use it. Um, so yeah, second, so continuing on that second generation, readers must learn how to operate the work. And then the third generation, uh, readers are already familiar with the platform. Um, so it's Twitter. So if you uh, already have Twitter, then you don't need to learn anything new about Twitter in order to follow a Twitter bot, for example. Um, okay, so the second generation, audiences tend to go to the work. In other words, you have to go to the author's website in order to find the thing. Whereas in the third generation, things tend to circulate where the audience already is. And that, of course, assumes like we're talking about audiences on social media like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, whatever, YouTube. Um, these are places where you are already consuming media or circulating media, and there are literary media among those things, and that's, that's what we're talking about. Of course, these are not hard and fast categories, or you know, this does not describe every second generation work and every third generation work, but these are emphases. These are different emphases across uh, those generations that help us understand what the movement is in terms of uh, these generations. And this last one is really the big one, and I think this is the really um, exciting part about this thinking. So, um, uh, second generation work, it does tend to emphasize modernist and experimental poetics. And uh, that, that is characterized by things like making it new, making it difficult, making it international, and connecting to an artistic and literary tradition. So, um, in the context of, this is like literary modernism. So think of like Ezra Pound, James Joyce, um, T.S. Eliot. Like these, these are works that are difficult for the sake of being difficult, you might say, or uh, to do something specific, but difficulty is definitely an aesthetic that, that you will see uh, with these works. Whereas postmodernism, uh, third generation is more postmodern. So third generation, according to Leo, and is gonna focus on things like remix, pastiche, uh, ready-made adaptations, and it connects to fandom and internet culture. So uh, again, these are things that are more kind of everyday, but also more accessible and also more like ironic, maybe cynical, but they have a, a different purpose ideologically than uh, modernist works. And I think that ideolog ideological shift is also is a pretty interesting uh, thread that I want to continue to, to pull on as I think about this work some more. Okay, so here's some examples. And these examples are a little rough, um, but I, I hope they will help kind of clarify how different uh, forms have existed in multiple generations. And so the, this is an example, I'm going to start with an example from uh, from, from Leo, and then I have another a couple examples of my own. So uh, if you think about bots, so bots are, um, I mean, we, we, I mostly talk about Twitter bots, but there are also, of course, um, chatter bots or chat bots. And we talked about several examples of those, but Eliza is really the, the grandmother of them all. And so we think about particular characteristics of Eliza. So Eliza, as originally programmed in 1966, was programmed just to do that one thing. It wasn't like uh, an existing platform, like a chat platform that was programmed with, um, intelligence for doing therapy. It was programmed from scratch by Joseph Weizenbaum, like that, and that was all it did. Um, in order to use it, you had to go to the machine where it was installed, and there was one of it. And so it was really cumbersome. Uh, it wasn't you know, something that was distributed widely until later. So people knew about it because Weizenbaum wrote a paper about it, uh, and he talked about it in his book, uh, a book whereby, by the way, he was really critiquing artificial intelligence. Um, but he's, um, but you know, you didn't, it wasn't distributed, it didn't go viral, it wasn't a thing that everyone was trying out until much later. Um, so I think the audience for it is not, it's not an explicitly literary audience. It's actually a computer science audience uh, originally, um, other researchers doing AI things. So it's, um, it was not conceived as literary at all. So moving ahead, um, Galatea. So Galatea we know as a work of interactive fiction, but within Galatea there is a character named Galatea who is a chatbot. And if you see her as a descendant of Eliza, uh, I think she does have some things that are um, you know, specific to second generation. So first of all, we do have, um, we have some specific software. We have IF, interactive fiction specific software. Uh, I actually don't know what language Galatea was programmed in or platform off the top of my head, but it's, it's one of them. There's a handful, um, probably informed but I don't know for sure. Um, I guess I could check, but I'll do that later. Um, but it's a specific thing um, that does this. Uh, the access, it is widely available, but it does require some non-trivial setup. Now, when I gave you all access to it, there is a web-based way to play interactive fiction. And so I just continue that, I can send you that link, 
but that's uh, using the parchment interpreter, and that's a relatively recent thing. Um, in the year 2000, when Galatea was first published, you had to have a, uh, a, a Zork, uh, no, a, um, a Z machine interpreter on your computer, something like uh, Gargoyle or Spatterlight, in order to play Galatea. So if you, uh, so anybody could install those things. Those are free tools. Galatea was distributed freely, but you had to know how to use them and where to find them in order to actually have them. So it was not like just everybody already had access to it. And so the audience, I think the audience for Galatea was initially somewhat niche. Like it was an interactive fiction community. People that make interactive fiction in this community are the main audience for these works, the new works. So they are really kind of creating new work for each other. And I think it's a great way to develop this kind of work. And, um, but it does mean that it's not, not exactly mainstream either. And that lack of going mainstream is kind of the challenge. Uh, that continues to be the challenge even for third gen work, right? I think what is like whatever it means to be mainstream at this point. So thinking about third generation, every word, and this is maybe not, I don't know, every word is not really a chatter bot or a chat bot, but it is a bot. And so I think it makes sense. It's the third gen thing to put in here. Um, it's uh, platform is Twitter. So you don't need anything special. Any, anybody can follow uh, every word uh, by Alison Parrish and that's it. I mean, access is trivial. Like you literally just follow it and you just see it in your timeline. Um, the audience is a little bit tricky because you have to know that it exists in order to follow it and what you make of it once you do decide to follow it is is going to vary widely. Uh, some people thought it was funny, some people thought it was pointless, some people thought it was, it was you know, brilliant conceptual poetry. Um, but that idea that people had a, enough access to it to have those different reactions I think is a characteristic of third generation work uh, in general. Um, lots of other bots obviously, but this is just the, the one that I still think of as kind of the archetype for literary bots. I think it was 2007 or maybe 2006. It was very early, right? So it was, it was um, really the, the template that everyone else is inspired by. So let's try another example with interactive fiction. So uh, Zork, right? So Zork is a game we've played and it is really very much interactive fiction, uh, just like, um, well, even before Galatea, right? So this is uh, a proprietary platform. Um, to access it, you'd have to purchase the software and run it on your computer. Uh, it'd be on a physical medium and you would put the disc, the floppy disk in your computer and play it if you had a computer. Um, so it definitely was widely distributed, but still not exactly mainstream maybe. Um, so you have to kind of, in the 1980s anyway, th that was the beginning of the PC revolution, but you know, not everybody had a computer. I mean, still not everyone has computers, but at that point anyway, uh, the people who were interested in computers might be interested in Zork. And so there was still a kind of uh, specific audience for, and community for that. And then we move ahead to Photopia. Sorry, I got the year wrong. It's 1998. Uh, you know, it is still IF specific software. Um, it is freely uh, distributed, but the setup or installation is non-trivial. It's the same as for Galatea. Um, you have to have specific software for it uh, in order to run it, but now you can play it on the web like I've, I've uh, linked for, for you all. Um, but, you know, the audience is still pretty niche. Like you're still pretty much looking at people that are um, interested in IF. Uh, I think Photopia is actually a great kind of ambassador work, like it does a good job of bringing people into that community, but it is still ultimately people that kind of already know what interactive fiction is and are interested in seeing a good example of it, and here's, here's a good example of it. So then moving ahead uh, quite a bit, uh, there's a game called uh, Gone Home, and um, I have, yeah, so, okay, so a couple things I could, I guess I could demo Gone Home, do I have it installed on here? Hang on a second, let me just check. Um, I know some of you are familiar with Gone Home, but others perhaps are not. So, uh, okay, I do not have it installed here. So I'm going to go ahead and let it install. Uh, it probably won't be done. Well, it, it, I don't know if I'll have time, but it'll take a few minutes to install on this computer. Um, it's a uh, it's a game where you play as a character who has uh, been away from home for a year, comes back home, but their family has moved to a new house, and so she's exploring this new house, and uh, she walks around the house and discovers. Um, sometimes things about the the family that are kind of confusing or could be disturbing depending on how you interpret them and it is a game that won a lot of acclaim and awards for writing and for doing something interesting with video games um, but it was um, also critiqued because some people felt like it's a video game so it should be fun but this isn't fun and uh, there's different uh, it became kind of a um, a meme in its own using the term walking simulator to describe what you're doing in the game uh, which is meant to be a derogatory term initially, but I think it's a term now embraced by people who make other works like that. Um, you know, think of uh, games like Firewatch uh, as another kind of walking sim. I think walking sims are brilliant. Edith Finch, like, I mean, there's a lot, there are lots of really good examples of those. Uh, but the audience is complicated. It is, it is a mainstream audience potentially because 
These are distributed via Steam, which is a popular platform for distributing PC and, and computer games. Um, but uh, whether or not everyone embraces a particular game on that platform is, of course, the question. But you still have to purchase it, and it's still something you have to access. But it is a game that many people know about, even if they haven't played it. And so that's why I think of it as a good example of a third generation work. I forgot to update that slide. That should be third generation. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I was doing this kind of quickly. So let me go ahead and edit this really quick. Because I also messed up the uh, Photobia year and gone home as third generation. Sorry about that. All right, cool. So these are examples. Um, and I, yeah, it's installed, but, oh no, it's still downloading, okay. Uh, yeah, I won't, I won't have time to demo Gone Home today. But okay, here's a couple other things to kind of get back to the idea of the, the generations and their differences and other few just kind of statements about interactive fiction as a specific uh, e electronic literary genre that expands these different uh, generations. So the first gen, it was proprietary physical media uh, that you had to install on your computer. Um, it existed alongside other computer games, and so it's definitely uh, consumed by people interested in computer games, but a particular kind of computer game that is highly literary. Um, the uh, second generation is, I think, characterized by that amateur community, and amateur doesn't mean like poor quality, but just people doing it for fun and for interest, and uh, the literary IF community produces works like Galatea and Photopia in that second generation. And then now I think we're in the third generation, and so we're kind of seeing what that is, but I think that we've kind of come back to um, video games as a community, and we're seeing things like um, distributed via, via Steam, right? So Steam and Itch are these platforms for distributing works that are uh, works made in, in Twine or works made with uh, Unity or different engines, um, but they are literary works that are interactive, and so I think they're kind of the new... Uh, state of the art with interactive fiction. So things like Gone Home or 80 Days, or um, what's that other one I just started playing? Uh, there's, uh, I can't think of what is it. Well, uh, Kentucky Route Zero is another um, one that I keep uh, meaning to play and I haven't gotten around to it yet. So these are examples that are distributed in the mainstream kind of platform. And that, it's that distribution platform that I think really characterizes these as third generation, more so than any formal qualities. I think the formal qualities are there too, distinguishing these three generations, but really the distribution platform makes the biggest difference, I think. Okay, so um, this was going to be a longer slide, but I ran out of time. Uh, but I think you could do the same thing with hypertext. You, know, you have things like uh, bespoke platforms like StorySpace are kind of first generation hypertext literary works, although you could go earlier, obviously, uh, with uh, Uncle Roger using um, BASIC originally and uh, distributed via um, Usenet. Um, but we, you still need special access in order to get that. Uh, whereas the second generation you have the web and then the third generation you have twine uh, which i think is uh, available via it, itch uh, you can make your games available via itch.io or your own websites uh, whatever you want to do oh yeah some some fallacies so um, i like the fallacies in in this because it, these fallacies help us kind of elaborate some of the nuances of what uh leah's talking about here and i thought I don't know. I, I think they're pretty interesting. I think there's probably there's at least one more fallacy that I want to talk about in the next slide. But these are, I think, pretty good. I mean, so and I just kind of made, made a thumbnail version of each of these, which is that um, the pioneer fallacy just that's just this uh, idea. We should not assume that because a work was the first of its kind that it is also the best of its kind or better than things that came later. Um, likewise, we also shouldn't assume that because something is newer, it's better. So if something is a, a third generation work, that doesn't even mean it's better than the first or second generation work. In fact, a lot of third generation works um, are created by people who don't even know about the first or second generation. So they're not really building on those works at all. And so really putting them as the logical consequence of the second generation doesn't really make sense. And so thinking of them as, as uh, newer really just means that we have different questions to ask about them and different platforms to, to study in different audiences. And those are good and interesting things, but that doesn't automatically tell us that it's a better work. Um, something can be viral without being good. Um, I think that's also, you know, kind of iffy, but like um, just because something's popular doesn't mean it's good, I guess. Um, hipster fallacy, I like this one. Um, just because it was really hard for someone to make it and they spend a lot of time making it doesn't mean it's better. And this is a hard one to realize. Uh, I think, I was just thinking like, um, I've made a bunch of Twitter bots and my two most popular bots I probably spent the least time on, you know, compared to all the other bots. Like uh, the bot that I spent the most time on probably was Exopalettes, and I really like it, um, but 
it's certainly not the most popular bot I've made. Um, Crooked Cosmos and the House Budgets, Twitter bots, those are the most popular. And I probably spent at least, uh, you know, maybe two or three hours on each of them originally. And then, you know, uh, from, you know, the uh, maintenance work over the years, but like the original <laughs> deployment was pretty trivial and compared to some of the other things I've done. That's okay. Um, and then uh, the user fallacy is also the converse of that, which is just that just because something is simple and easy doesn't mean it's bad or worse than something that was complicated. And I think this is a, a good way to get away from that kind of elitism or uh, insularity of the second generation, actually. So I think there's another fallacy, and I, I'm going to call this, this the historicization fallacy, uh, which is, I should probably, let me do, let me just make another copy of the slide real quick and show you what I mean by this, because I don't want you to think that this is what I mean. Um, the, the historicization fallacy is the mistake, or when you make the mistake of looking at these generations in a teleological way or a consequentialist way, or kind of seeing the them as the first generation begat the second generation, which begat the third generation. And this is really a problem with any kind of periodization. And I, and I make a similar critique of thinking about uh, video game generations. It's a useful, like convenient way to organize things, uh, or a convenient way to write a textbook, but it's also, I think, somewhat misleading in some ways. So I want to draw a line through this model of the uh, of these three things. I wonder if, can I make that, I'm gonna make that a red line, um, just to kind of really drive this home. Can I do it like this, you think? Yeah, yeah, there we go. And then I'll make that red because I want to I want to get away from this. It's really just that these things happen after the thing that came before. It's not that the thing before caused the thing that came after it or that the thing that came after it really depended on it. Although, you know, it certainly sort of did sometimes for certain examples and there's specific people who have works in all three genres or generations and certainly they could look at themselves as kind of building on their own prior work. But I think it would be a mistake to think of the third generation especially as a consequence of the second generation because as I said a minute ago, Lots of people make things that are third generation electronic literature, but have never heard the term electronic literature. So they're definitely not building off of kind of the most successful or influential works in the second generation because they never heard of them. And that's, I mean, they maybe should learn about the second generation, but they don't have to in order to produce good work. So uh, this is what I mean by the historicization fallacy. Maybe there's another term for it. Maybe the teleological fallacy would be a better term, although that's kind of a technical word. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I, don't, I was about to rewrite that slide, but maybe I shouldn't. Uh, just keep it simple for now. Historicization or tele teleological fallacy. Okay, so I just found a couple examples, right? So these are uh, examples of third generation elit, and this is a, um, this one takes a bit to explain and unpack, um, but that's kind of a characteristic of third generation elit. Like there's there are layers to this. So this is someone uh, on Twitter, Tor Torche, um, and she's created a work here that is a parody of and making fun of a style of poetry popularized by Rupi Kaur on Instagram. And there's a tip, there's a uh, conventional kind of formula to those poems, not formula, but there's a way that those are often printed and have imagery accompanying them. I believe this is also referencing a TikTok meme, although I'm not totally sure, um, but it's a, it's, there, there are layers here, basically is what I'm saying. It's like a burrito, there are layers. Um, so yeah, this is just a link if you wanna look at it in context. And maybe if you know that, I, I, again, I think there is a TikTok meme that's being referenced as well. Um, but if, if you know it, let me know, you can share the, you can explain this to me, but um, uh, you at least see the basic. Okay, so Faith con is confirming, great. Uh, so here's another example on Twitter again. I, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time on Twitter, so I hope it's okay to share some Twitter examples. Um, Adam Ellis is a guy who makes uh, web comics. I don't actually read his web comics, but he um, is. He did this thing in started in 2017, where he started. Um, okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I still, I mean, I saw that video in the Twitter thread with that, but I still don't really, like, I don't know what the, I haven't watched it, so I don't know. Maybe it's not TikTok, it's actually, because that's a YouTube video. Anyway, um, the, so Adam Ellis did this thing where it was kind of ARG-like, alternate reality game-like, or um, something, and uh, Adam Ellis being a fairly popular webcomic creator, 
has a pretty big audience. So this kind of is a good example of a third gen kind of work. Uh, where he just kind of started casually tweeting every now and then uh, updates to this kind of story. Um, he did later say that, yeah, this was a story, but you can certainly uh, see how it being presented like this with the kind of veneer of authenticity using social media and its kind of playful way that we pretend to believe everyone out there is real, um, that, you know, that kind of authenticity to tell this story. And it has this, it's the story of his apartment being, and really him, him being haunted by this, uh, the ghost of this child. And it's a really creepy story. He has like video evidence of it. It's really creepy. And it, it was a really good example of an internet ghost story, which um, is a, a, a thing, a kind of, uh, I guess, web 2.0 or 1.0 genre, uh, certainly. Um, and so it was, it was pretty cool. But it, it, this is the kind of thing that would have been a creepy website or a, uh, a creepy pasta on a message board in the late 90s. Um, but now it's a Twitter thread. And that's, that's the new, that's the third generation uh, in, at work there. Um, so another example, like we, I, I've shared this a couple of times, but Shelly Jackson, you know, she's the author of My Body and Wonder Camera and Patchwork Girl, but also she produced, she publishes this story uh, kind of word by word whenever it snows and it's on Instagram. And so it's third gen in the sense that it's distributed through that platform of Instagram. You don't need anything special. You don't need to go anywhere special. You just follow it and then it just shows up in your Instagram feed whenever she updates it. So that's an you know, example of uh, third gen because of that distribution aspect of it. Um, yeah, and this one, like, this is kind of this too, um, I don't know to the extent to which you would call this literary, but uh, this is a Facebook group where we pretend to be ants, and this is, there's a couple of these groups actually, but this I think is the canonical one, uh, I don't know, some of you may be members, it has 1.9 million members, so uh, I suspect some of you are a member of this uh, group, and I don't know if it's still, it does not seem quite as um, noisy as it was for a while, but uh, people pretend to be ants. And they, we, we do, well, when, when something is needed, we will join in the effort and lift or eat or fight or whatever it is. It's uh, very silly. <laughs> All right, so some questions. And uh, I mean, we're out of time for the lecture, but I think there are some questions that I want you to think about, which is, uh, you know, I was really struck by one comment in here, one quotation in the essay, and I'll, I'll just show, see if I can get to it really quickly. Uh, he's quoting Matthew Kirschenbaum, and uh, well, see, the search doesn't work very well, does it? Um, I'll have to find it now. Um, doo -doo -doo. It was near the end. I think I highlighted it, so maybe I can find it quickly. Yeah, well, here it is. Um, yeah, as I said, oof. Um, this is, I think, a pretty important critique of electronic literature as a community, not just um, not just the literary form, but the, the community of people who produce and study this kind of work. And he says here that difficulty, seriousness, and conceptual density are all characteristics that have served to gain ELIT a firm institutional purchase in academia where difficulty and seriousness are rewarded. So I, I think this is a critique. I think this is a an important critique uh, to point out that in some ways the, the um, the, the challenge of ELIT, like the works that being hard to read. That's what, that's what he's talking about here, conceptual distancy, density. The things that you as people who may be new to electronic literature struggle with, um, he kind of points out here that these are sort of self-serving characteristics. And it has occurred to me that in many cases, when I assign work that I you know find difficult, um, I, I enjoy it. I mean, I, I'm not lying when I say I enjoy these works, but they also, um, you know, the, the people producing these works are often other people like me. There are people that are professors at universities and they also, they teach classes about electronic literature. They also produce electronic literature as, as do I, um, a little bit more so I, I teach about it and, and, and write about it. Um, but you know, this idea of a community sort of creating work for each other and then talking about each other's work, um, th th that doesn't strike me as the most sustainable model. <laughs> like at some point, that's got to break down and i think there are some interesting and important conversations happening right now in the electronic literature community which i don't have time to go into because we're out of time but also it just it, it takes a lot of unpacking uh to really critique some of the power structures in the elite community i think that's that's going on at the moment and um uh, on facebook mostly um, we have a discord but we also have there's a big facebook group of people that uh, work on this stuff and uh there have been some important critiques uh over the past uh, uh, few weeks so 
be interested to see where that goes. But I think the third generation model, uh, the idea of and, and the in, uh, energy around the third generation may uh, provide some uh, inertia for that as well. So good. Um, so that's all I have to say for now. I'm going to wrap up the, the lecture. Um, but thanks for watching. And if you are in the even cohort, remember, I'll see you on Wednesday in person and everyone else. I'll see you online on Wednesday. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it. So, um, and if you're not in the class, thanks for watching anyway. <laughs> uh, so cool. So I'll switch to the bird cam for a few minutes. I have not seen any birds, but the, you know, the sunlight looks kind of nice going across it. Um, so, um, I'll just, I'll just switch to that for a few minutes anyway, and I will see you all, uh, later. <laughs>